employees at Organic Valley. I'm still an Organic Valley vegetable grower. My husband and I also grow a lot of cover crops. Um, and we have an international 80 pull type combine. So I know what it is to, pull, to clean a combine, even though it's a small combine. It's still hard to clean. And um, I was just recently appointed to the National Organic Standards Board, which is a citizen advisory board to the National Organic Program. I start my four-year sentence um, January 24th. And I really do want to hear from people if there's anything that, um, that, this, that we should know about out there in the world that is uh, stifling organic or a barrier for you or even anything that's working really great. Um, uh, I can, I have just a little bit closer to trying to make a positive influence. Okay. And Moses is located in the up in Wisconsin, but Illinois is one of our core states. We put on the largest organic farming conference in the known universe. There's a, a flyer there in the back. Uh, it's the end of February, and uh, if you've never come, you should. <laughs> and then you'll become addicted, and you'll come every year. Oops. Okay. So how is organic different from conventional? I think you know that. We cannot use any petroleum or chemically based fertility pest control or weed control inputs. So there is no organic herbicide. Okay, There is an acetic acid that you can use like around the bins or something like that, but there's nothing you spray out in the field. Um, we can only use natural sources of fertility, naturally mined rock powders, animal manures, Things like kelp or fish emulsion, and not every fish emulsion would be approved because they typically contain phosphoric acid to bring down the pH so they don't blow up. You certainly wouldn't want to have a, a tank of fish emulsion blow up on you. That would be very ugly and very stinky. Um, and we use natural methods of weed and pest control. So this is what you've been hearing about all day today so far, timely cultivation, uh, encouragement of natural insect enemies, um, crop rotation. So this is a systems-based approach. This is not input substitution. So it's really the main thing with organic farming is that, as with all farming, it's a routine. Okay? You know when you have to get out and plant. You know when you have to do certain things on your farm. In organic, you're just going to do different things. So the first with the years of transition, and probably for another three to five years after that, you're going to be developing your systems. You're going to be working on your routine. You're going to, you know, kind of get in the habit of organic farming. And it's just similar, you know, except in conventional <coughs> lot, the habit is calling up the co-op, right, and having them take the soil tests, come out and put the fertility inputs on for you, and then you go out and pr uh, uh, plant, and then they spray. So this is no farming by phone. Okay, this is the farmer's footsteps out there in the field and, and seeing what needs to be done. And it really naturally mimics organic systems. This is the strength of organic, is that we're not working against nature, we're working with nature. Um, okay, so there's a $5,000 exemption from organic certification. Not from the organic rules. So people could be selling, let's say, at the farmer's market, and uh, they don't uh, make $5,000, or don't sell more than $5,000 a year in, in organically labeled products, um, but uh, they can still say they're organic. But if, let's say, you only have, uh, you're, you're, you're transitioning your farm, and you have one field where the hay is certifiable, right? It's met the other, all the other recommend, um, requirements. You can't <coughs> sell anything that's going to be further processed under the exemption from certification. If it's going to be used so that that beef cow is going to be processing that hay, right? The final product for sale is the beef, <laughs> not the hay. So you can't uh, be exempt from certification at that five thousand dollar level, and still sell to someone else who's certified organic. And as we were just talking, there's no transition to organic label in the marketplace right now. Basically, a non-GMO. Um, but as with organic, it's always a good idea to know your buyers because they're going to have probably requirements for what you what the varieties they want. They have markets who want certain varieties. 
So always talk with your buyers, uh, even in the transition years, because they may suggest a certain variety and will be more willing to give you a premium for a variety that they're looking for um, if it's in transition. So this is the definition of organic, according to the USDA, and uh, it's a really good definition. I don't agree with everything in the rule, and now I get a chance to make some points made um, when I'm on the board, but, but if you notice, it's not about what we don't do, okay? It's not, not about we're not using synthetic herbicides, we're not using synthetic fertilizers. It's a, it's a system that is site specific. So this is not a cookie cutter approach to farming. This is you knowing your land. This is why a lot of farmers get into organic, because they have this connection with their land. It's with their family or whatever. And so you integrate cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster the cycling of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biodiversity. And all the farmers that have been talked to us so far, you probably will see, you know, everything that they were talking about was this, right? The balance of their farm, the cycling of resources, right? Planting cover crops, using the nitrogen credits from those cover crops, the mechanical practices, biological practices, cultural practices. Um, and so, again, not based on inputs. We do use inputs, but as much as possible, we want to use the natural systems to help us with our agricultural production. So the certification process is this. You choose a certification agency. We have a list on our website. I think there's only one more book back there um, that has lists. Anybody who took that little green book um, on the, um, the upper Midwest Organic Resource Directory. There's a lot of certifiers active in Illinois. Um, all of them have to follow the National Organic Program rules, and they're all accredited by the USDA. So you choose who you want. There's a fact sheet back there on how do you choose, what kind of questions to ask the people. It's basically based on uh, cost and service. Okay, not on the not on the standards. Standards are all the same. Then the uh, you send in an application, usually some kind of deposit. They get your application and they may ask for more information if they notice you have five fields and you didn't give them, uh, you only gave them maps for three. They'll say, give me the other two maps. Once they feel that application's complete, they will assign an inspector. So you know a neighbor who's an organic farmer and they like their inspector, you can't request an inspector. They decide. Um, and the crops must be seen during the growing season. So there's no organic inspectors wandering around today looking at corn. <laughs> because there might be some people on organic dairy farms, but um, they'll usually have a second inspection during the growing season. The inspector sends uh, anywhere from two to six hours on your farm, depending how far apart all the uh, farm fields are that they have to go look to, look at. They write a report, they send it to the agency. So the, the inspector does not make the decision. It's up to the agency based on your application and what the inspector saw on the farm. And then the agency then either approves or denies certification, or they might say, we notice there's some erosion on this field. You need to improve, you know, do something to mitigate that erosion by next year. They'll still give you certification, but then next year the inspector will, will look at what you did about that erosion. So here, three to five hours, um, and they will look at everything. They'll look at the crops. They'll look at every single field. They are mandated to go to every field. Um, they'll be looking at buffer zones, which I'll explain what that is. They'll want to know what you project your harvest to be. So especially if you're doing organic and non-organic, then they're making sure that none of the non-organic doesn't accidentally end up in the organic sales stream. Um, but it's, it's not a, a, they're not there as the organic police. They're basically there to verify what you wrote in your application, which is known as the organic system plan. And while they can't consult with you and tell you you should try this fertility, you should have this rotation, they can kind of uh, just discuss with you what you're doing, maybe ask you some questions that might stimulate you to think about other options and to improve your management system. There is organic certification cost share. How many people know about this? A few. Okay, good. So 
if once you're certified, once you have an actual organic certificate, you can get funds back. It's distributed right now from the State <coughs> Department of Agriculture. $750 per year or three quarters of the cost, whichever is less. So if you pay $1,000 for your certification, you can get $750 back. You have to lay it out, you have to give it to the certifier first, and then after October 1st, you can apply and, and get, um, get it back. And then the payment is per scope. So if you have organic crops and organic <coughs> livestock, you can get up to $1,500. Uh, $1, dollars back. But only if you've paid at least two thousand dollars for your organic certification. Okay, so that's the maximum you can get, but up to three quarters of the cost. And you included user fees there. That include that's included the, the point, user fees. Of yep. Some some certification agencies have a sliding scale, some <coughs> have a flat rate, some charge you a flat rate plus a user fee for their seal based on the uh, dollars of organic sales that you have. So it's 1.2% for one certifier, half of 1% for another. Those user fees are included in the seven in, in your total amount that they're based on the $750 seven. the maximum? Or if you're grossing a million dollars, can you get no. three quarters of it? So $750 mm -hmm. is the maximum. It's the maximum of the, of the cost share that you can get. Unless you have more than one scope. If you're selling livestock and you're making sausages and you grow crops, then it's three scopes. So then it's 750 times three. So the transition period to organic, um, you need to be careful. This is the one place where people do kind of get tripped up. That even though you don't have to use organic seed during your transition years, you cannot use any seed that had a non-approved seed treatment. So if that corn was pink, don't use it if you're in transition to organic because your transition date will start all over again based on the date that you planted that seed. So you can use um, nitrogen-fixing rhizobial bacteria, but you've got to make sure it's not GMO. And I'll get into seeds later. So all the fields must have distinct boundaries and buffer zones. And I don't know if you've seen this, but a lot of people are kind of pulling out the fence rows, right? And then they <coughs> stick a post in the ground and put a bucket on it, and they say, this is the field, <laughs> right? Where's the field border? We have to know exactly where the field border is, <coughs> and there'll need to be a buffer zone if it directly adjoins non-organic crops, and I'll get into how big that is. The rule is no prohibited substances for 36 months preceding the harvest of the organic crop. So if you want to harvest first crop hay, you couldn't have had Roundup on that field in August three years previous, right? Because the first crop hay would be harvested in the May or so. You wouldn't make the 36 months. So it's not three years, it's 36 months. So you count forward from the last application of a prohibited substance to when you want to harvest a crop. And it can happen that you may have the first and second crop hay not be organic that year, and the third crop is. So, um, I'm sorry. Yep. I mean, I need to interrupt for a second. There are two cars that are blocking the mailbox that I just need to move. Sorry. Um, and I had the license plates, so <laughs> I'm just going to read them really quick. Yeah, I think. <laughs> sorry. Uh, the Lexus E94-3588. And a Ford F-150 72579M. So if one of those is your vehicle, it needs to get moved somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. That's all right. So previously found <laughs> land can grow on our, an organic crop immediately. No waiting time. So it's not like one day you wake up and say, I'm starting my organic transition today. It just goes back to what was the last state of prohibited substance. But if it, just a CRP land that you might be renting from someone else that's coming out of CRP, you would still need documentation that they didn't spot spray it or whatever. You have to make sure that it was truly uh, 36 months. But, but that can be used immediately. Just be careful. We have a whole uh, fact sheet on using CRP land for organic production. Fallow does not mean fertile. 
And if it went into CRP, it was probably poor ground when it went in. And if it sat there for 20 years, it's probably still poor ground. <laughs> it may have a little bit more biological life, but it didn't really add a lot of nutrients. Um, and you don't have to have every field or every crop certified on the farm, and you can have your crop certified and not your livestock. I mean, it's totally up to you. So you can have 150 acres certified organic and 3,000 acres conventional, and that's just fine. As long as we can tell what field is the organic field, and it's got a distinct boundary and a buffer zone if needed. So this is what everybody hates, right? Paperwork. This is why people say, I'm not going to get organic because I have to do this paperwork. But really, you have all this paperwork almost all of you already. If any of you fill out a Schedule F <laughs> for your taxes, you probably have most of it. The main thing that you would have to add is, is tracking of where and when you apply materials. And if you're really paying attention to your farm, you're doing that already. Even when you're buying uh, conventional inputs. You want to know, was that worthwhile? Did I really get a yield boost like the salesman told me I was going to get by using this product? So people do it any way they want. They put it on their phones, they put it on their in a spiral book. I don't like when you put it in a little notepad in your pocket. As an organic inspector, I saw way too many of those go through the laundry. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got you know, a whole year's worth of your stuff and, it, and the only thing is it has to be easily auditable. So organic inspectors have not learned the Vulcan mind melt. So if you tell the inspector that all the information's in my head, it's not easily auditable. So you have to write it down. But how many of you can remember what, what field you had corn five years ago? And what inputs you put on it? No. Write it down. And those historical records are going to be important to you to be a better manager on your farm. And if you're following what all these other organic farmers are saying, you're going to be experimenting, you're going to want to know what works, what doesn't work. And the only way you're going to be able to track is by keeping records. So this is some of what you'll have to have. A map. Um, Field maps, you know, farmstead maps so you can see where the storage is, the history of what was in each field and what materials were used. You can even keep track of what seed, if you're maybe you're trialing out different seeds from different organic seed suppliers, um, what you did when in the fields, um, input records, harvest records, storage records, sales records, and if you're selling anything uh, retail, the labels. But you can easily use a farm service agency map. I'm sure all of you know how to get one of those. Um, and then you just handwrite the, the various field numbers and such, and then those um, correlate with your field histories. So a buffer zone. The regulation does not specifically say how big <coughs> it is. It must be of sufficient size to prevent the unintended application of a prohibited substance. If you've got somebody errantly spraying on a regular basis next to your organic field, your buffer zone may need to be 100 feet. But typically for ground-driven, you know, equipment, you know, the booms, uh, you know, getting pulled behind the tractor, it's about 25 to 30 feet. That's what most of the certifiers here in the upper Midwest are requiring. Um, but if you if it's trees, let's say you somebody planted uh, arborvita trees and they're right next to each other and it's this dense uh, they don't get very wide, you could get by with ten feet because it just has to be of sufficient size to prevent drift. And uh, and we're not going to talk maybe at the end about pesticide drift, but the more you do and are proactive. <coughs> in preventing pesticide drift, like putting up signs, being on drift watch. Um, if you do have a neighbor who causes drift onto your organic field past your buffer, um, you then have a better chance of getting a settlement from them. Why did, how, how come you didn't see my sign? I had, you know, I'm up on drift watch. 
I mean, you can say that. You at least try. You weren't hiding that you were organic, right? Because some of them, I've heard people say, oh, well, just giving them some free herbicide. <laughs> you know, they don't have to spray it. But that's, that's not what you want, right? And it's a good idea to talk to your neighbor in a friendly way and say, I'm, I'm entering this niche market. Can you please be careful around my fields? Don't, you don't have to say, if you do, I'm going to sue you. If you don't, I'm going to sue you. I mean, you don't have to say that. But just let them know. So with that question, What's if it? you didn't apply it yourself, can you still stay compliant? If it's, if it's a big enough bird, are you still compliant even though you didn't do it? Uh, you, you can't sell um, crops that have had drift on them as organic. Is that what you're asking? No, what I'm asking is, so that's that same portion. I grew the seed properly. I did my portion properly. So if you have somebody <clears throat> applies a product to it, are you going to have to start over for three or three years? Yeah, so you mean if there was an accidental direct yes. application, you bet. And those, I've seen most people get um, a settlement. Because that would be anybody. If somebody came in and sprayed Roundup and it wasn't Roundup ready alfalfa, mm -hmm. and they killed your alfalfa, you'd be, you'd be able to get a settlement for that, right? The main problem we find with the insurance companies is that they don't want to pay the organic price. Yeah. Do the inspectors inspect those areas <coughs> specifically that are contiguous to another farm? You bet. They, they want to see so every... So you would know right away as opposed to growing, going through the season and taking it to market and finding out. Yeah, no. Right? But you would know by just even by looking at the map. Okay. So you could see if you're adjoining wooded no, lands or... I would know that it's been sprayed. Let's say the farmer sprays... And if it's a crop... If it's a commodity yeah. crop, or it's obviously not in CRP, or something like that, um, you don't have to get a letter. But if you, so you don't, and it's totally up to the certifier, they'll be with you, yeah. So how is the drift uh, ascertained? Is it, is well, it's a, it, if, if you feel like you've had field? drift, right, you're going to notice some damage to your crops. You Or if you see them, or you smell them, if you smell it, you're being drifted on. Okay? So you need to call the State Department of Agriculture. They have a pesticide and frost from Prioro. I don't know exactly what it's called here in Illinois. And they have people that come out, and they will verify. And that's also very important if you want to get a settlement. You know, if it's just a little bit, you might just say, OK, I'm just going to take a little extra buffer. You tell your certifier, you say, I'm taking off. And, and it's up to the certifiers what they feel. If they feel it's just a slight amount of drift, they may not take the land out for three years. They may only take the land out for one year from organic certification. But if it's a direct hit, right, the, the, uh, the chemical applicator is reading the map upside down and they go into totally the wrong field, and this has happened, as you probably all know, and you get a direct hit, that's definitely out for three years. But if you're, if, it, if you're adjacent to a non-organic and yep. they're spraying, and the wind's in the uh, in a direction that it's coming over to you, and it's obvious. Well, that's the whole point of the 25 waters, to 30 feet. But it, with a with a, a, a two mile an hour wind, 25 or 30 feet is not keeping that drift from my crop. Well, if you notice damage, then you'll have to t not sell that crop as organic and notify the certifier. So how do certifiers? I mean, on a they all deal basis, with it differently. Okay. So. Record keeping is an important <coughs> aspect, and as I said, management decisions are based on your own historical reference and knowledge. There's nothing more valuable than knowing about what ha what works and doesn't work on your farm. So, record keeping. Excuse make me. Yeah. Can we go back to that? So, wh what remedy does the organic farmer have to uh, to try to make the uh, the non-organic farmer neighbor? A better neighbor and more compliant to, to help me keep my my crop organic. So the the question is, what's the remedy if somebody is, if you're having drift on your land? How do you how do you get them to stop? Well, it really depends a lot on who's doing it. If it's to the actual neighbor who's supplying the pesticides, usually they're feeling you know a lot like oh I'm really sorry and you know you've got a relationship with this person. If it's the co-op or it's some kind of rented land next door and the owner lives in another state and you have no relationship, it's a lot harder to get them to stop the drift. Um, I'm actually one of, that's one of my things I want to work on on the National Gang Standards Program is to have the NOP have some, some 
basically have the organic farmers back. Because right now, you're kind of just out on your own. You can decide to sue, you can whatever. I mean, you don't really have a lot of choices. And it depends a lot on the Illinois laws. Minnesota's different, Iowa's different, Wisconsin's different. Um, but all of them have some kind of trespass law because you're not supposed to have any drift. It's never, not supposed to go over the fence line. You as a landowner or a renter are supposed to have complete control of everything within your border. And the you know, incursion of an uh, unwanted substance is considered trespass or nuisance or, you know, there's all these different legal terms. So I'm going to keep moving because I know I'm that. behind. <laughs> so the record keeping, this is, the, I think, one of the last slides about record keeping because I know nobody likes it. But, <coughs> but it's really not that hard. Just make a habit. Have a place for where you put your receipts. When you buy your seeds, where's the seed invoice going to go? Okay? When you're getting your inputs, when somebody's coming in and doing a custom planting job and you, uh, and you have them sign something that they cleaned it before they got there, and you should also check it. Um, just, just have a place where you put your organic records. Um, a file cabinet, a three-ring binder, an envelope. Put the year on it so you don't get last year's mixed up with this year's. Keep a small notebook in the tractor or the pickup truck. Um, and then keep track of the harvests and, and how they're used, especially if you're feeding your own livestock from your own feet. So organic mandates a soil building rotation, promoting soil fertility, soil structure, and increased organic matter. And you'll find that a lot of the things that you do on an organic farm uh, for, for fertility also help you in weed control and also help you in pest management because it's a systems-based approach. And at any time that you can do something that has multiple benefits, you're way ahead. So putting in uh, cover crops that, have nit you know, that are nitrogen fixers, right? You're preventing erosion, you're getting nitrogen, you're building organic matter when it's getting incorporated. When, that, when you have high organic matter in your soil, when you're cultivating, it's going to flow in the row better. You're not going to throw clods. It's, it, it's a systems-based approach. So as someone already said, you cannot, okay, inorganic, corn, 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 beans, corn, 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 is not considered an acceptable crop rotation. Okay? You must <coughs> rotate crops that are of different species. And corn beans, corn beans, corn beans, corn beans is not a rotation in organic. You must break that row crop rotation with some sort of sod crop. Now you can have a real short rotation where you do corn, beans, oats with a red clover under sowing till in that red clover and go back to corn, beans, oats. So then in a three-year rotation, you have two years of row crop, one year of sod crop. If you want to have corn, beans, corn, beans, or whatever, you know, four, usually four years of row crop is about all the certifiers will allow because you're not doing a soil building rotation if you have continuous row crop. And what does that rotation give you? It breaks pest cycles. It breaks disease cycles. It breaks weed cycles. So you're getting multiple benefits from a good rotation. Yeah. I'm sorry, does that include your cover crop within that? Are you talking about strictly the cash crop rotation? Or nope. are you including your cover crop within that cycle? Well, the cover crop would have been the red clover under the oats. Right. Because you wouldn't have harvested that. I mean, you could <coughs> harvest it if you wanted to. Um, but you cannot do continuous row crop. And you can't grow crops of the same species or family in the same field repeatedly without interruption. So corn on corn can, is not allowed unless you put in a cover crop in between. So if you can, get, if you can fly in something into your corn, you maybe could do two years of corn, but then we'll want you to go more. I mean, in Wisconsin, where we have a lot of dairies, organic dairies, they'll allow a corn on corn rotation. Um, as long as the farmer is putting in a cover crop after that first year of corn, but then they seed it down, 
and it's, it's a one year of small grain, and then there's alfalfa for four years. So in a seven year rotation, they only have two years of row crop. So that's a soil building rotation, right? I was under the impression in six years you could only have four years of row crop. Yeah. Is that correct? Well, each certifier deals with it a little bit differently, but about that's about as long as they'll let you go with continuous row crop, even if you've got cover crops in there. Because <coughs> of all the cultivation, you're not building organic matter, right? You're destroying organic matter every time you cultivate. So we want to build soil. And this will only help you talk to any of the organic farmers in the room. Even though, so, so you got your high value crops, and you just budget it in that you're going to have a little bit lower value crop later. And you start working with buyers. If you want to grow some nice dairy alfalfa, I'll tell you, the people in Wisconsin are buying it from North Dakota. Illinois is a lot closer. <laughs> but if you don't want to have uh, hay in your rotation, you don't have to. You can work it out. You're not mandated. And you're not mandated to grow food grade crops. There's a lot of livestock producers up there in Wisconsin, let me tell you. And even non-livestock uh, feed wheat, that goes a lot of chickens. We have a lot of poultry in Iowa and Wisconsin, organic. And that's used a lot in poultry rations. Organic poultry rations is wheat. So you can grow organic wheat, and it may not get the premium for food grade, but it can be for, for feed grade. So this is the mandate. This is the actual wording from the rule. Selected implementation <coughs> that maintains or improves the physical, chemical, and biological condition of soil and minimizes soil erosion. Mandate. But anytime you do this, you're only helping yourself. Right? You're just improving the fertility of your soil. You're going to have better yields, better crops. Everything's wonderful. So negative impacts of tillage. There's a lot of things you can do. The cover crops having small grains and perennial legumes in rotation, um, incre increasing the micro and macro organisms, that makes the soil more resilient. You all know what nice soil looks like, right? We've heard people say you want it to look like chocolate cake. Okay, just a little crumbly, but still have some aggregate, dark brown, smells great, you might not want to eat it, but maybe you would. I don't know. And carbon is sequestered, and this is the, they have been doing uh, studies at the University of Wisconsin Madison that shows that uh, there's more carbon in an organic system than in a continuous no-till conventional system, which has had no tillage. There's more carbon in an even with all of the tillage when you're doing the cover crops and everything. So, I don't know, there really wasn't a lot of talk here about the no-till system. I wouldn't recommend this for the first time, you, you know, your first year of organic farming. It's a little bit uh, tricky, but more and more people are doing it. And this is where you roll the rye, okay, and you've got this nice roller crimper. You come in with either a row crop or a drill, something aggressive that could get down there and get seed to soil contact. It comes up and there's a mulch. You do no cultivating, and, and then you have a beautiful field of soybeans. It does, as people said, it doesn't work that good with corn yet. We're still working on that. Actually, if you are doing corn for silage, you can make it work. You put some, uh, in the early spring, you put some manure on, and then you take off the corn, and then you plant the corn kind of late, right? Because going into rye, the rye has to be at a certain uh, stage, and it's usually sometime mid-June. But if it's for silage, then you can get by with that. Okay, keep moving. So, this is from Rodeo. This is 20 years of similar tillage and, and inputs, uh, except here in the organic. That's a disc of the soil, right? Is this chocolate cake? What's this? Mud. Mud. <laughs> So there's really a difference, and, and over time, I mean, on my own farm, I did this. I had some land that was like that yellow clay, and it had no topsoil on it. It is like chocolate cake now. Beautiful. I mean, it took time, but I got there. So cover cropping, it's not just for erosion. It can hold your nutrients, so it holds nitrogen. So if you put manure on in the fall, and you have a, a rye crop, it's going to hold your nitrogen 
till the next spring when you till it in. Of course, it'll pre uh, you know, prevent wind and water erosion, prevents, you know, lessens compaction. Um, it could be a fertilizer. It could be a living mulch where we saw people having interseeding. And another thing that we do have done in Wisconsin is uh, we're working with the NRCS and we're hoping it's going to expand to other states where um, we're put it using the NRCS cover crop um, uh, practice standard and um, flying in seed at, in August, late August, just with an aerial, aerial seeder. And it's been working really beautifully. <coughs> And then, of course, you can have that living cover crop and, and forage animals on it. So look at shallow tillage whenever you can. You know, get a rotary hoe, tine weeders, flame weeders. Um, the organic farmer has a lot of tools in their toolbox. None of them that expensive. <coughs> you know, you can find stuff in people's fence rows <laughs> that you can, you know, stick on a toolbar. And, and, it's, and it just depends on the conditions. I mean, a lot of, most organic farmers have more than one cultivator, just depending, you know, which includes the flame meter. So the national list. This is, so now I was just talking about systems, but there are inputs. And the national list is a list of exceptions. Our rule is that everything that's natural is approved. Everything that's synthetic is not allowed. Except if it's synthetic and on the national list, then it's allowed. And if it's natural on the national list, then it's prohibited. So talk about confusing, <laughs> right? Why don't they just give us a list? The rest of the world in organic gives you a list of everything that's allowed, natural, synthetic, and just look at the list. If it's not there, you can't use it. We have to guess, right? Is it natural? Is it synthetic? This is why you have to have a certifier. They'll tell you what's allowed, what's not, or you can call me. And to me, if it's not confusing enough, it's broken up into crops, livestock, and ingredients and processed products. So there are some things that are allowed in livestock, but not allowed in crops. That might be considered like a soil amendment or something like that. So just be careful when you're reading the national list that you're looking at the right section for your type of production, crops, livestock, and handling. No genetic engineering. There's one exception there that vaccines are allowed that are genetically engineered for livestock. No sewage sludge. And we're not that far here. I don't know how many people from northern Illinois? Anybody ever heard of melorganite? Yes. Yeah. Melorganite? You know what it is? <laughs> is it natural? No. It's natural, but where is, what's it come from? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. <laughs> Not allowed. You use that, you're out for three years. Okay, 36 months from the date of application. And no irradiation. And of course, it can't be grown or processed with anything that would have been prohibited. Period? Yeah. I, I read in Cornucopia that there is an exception for fracking wastewater that's been processed. We'll talk about that later. Okay. And that's not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just will warn everyone, okay, I'm going to probably get in trouble. Anybody who's a spot for Cornucopia, don't always believe everything they say. Um, we can talk about that later. They have, they have a, you know, they have their own agenda. Yeah. I thought they were changing the use of biosolids as long as the crop was not used for direct human consumption. No. And I'm going to talk about manure. But it's not sewage sludge. So even lime from a sewage treatment plant, not allowed. And of course, um, nothing that's not on the national list is approved if it's synthetic. So here's what you can use for fertility. And you have this list in your uh, handout. So certain things like, uh, you know, you want calcium sulfate, you can use gypsum. You want calcium sulfate from recycled warbler, they'll give it to you for free. Somebody's tearing out a building. But it contains paint and glues and anti-mold compounds and fungicides and those things are not allowed. So it's not just the active ingredient, something we're looking at, we're looking at everything. So it's a, a very strict rule, really. Um, as long as the mine products have not been chemically altered, it's okay. So you take calcium um, 
carbonate, which is limestone, and you cook it, and you get calcium oxide. BioCal, have you ever heard of that from Midwest BioLab? Not allowed, because it's calcium carbonate that's been chemically changed from calcium carbonate to calcium oxide. Okay, hydrated lime is not allowed as a fertilizer. Oops, sorry. But it is allowed for like people <coughs> in orchards to spray on their trees for disease control. So it's allowed. So you have to read the annotations. And if you're going to add anything besides manure, you need to document with a soil test why you needed that input. So again, why would you be putting something on there if you didn't know if you needed it? And at what levels? So you need to be looking at is it some, you know, some pellets are okay, pure clay is okay, even you know, coated seed, depends what it is. Dust suppressants, what is it? Chelators, heavy metals, all these things the certifier will look at for you. So never use anything until you get approval from the certifier. So like all this stuff, not allowed. So just get rid of it. <laughs> Um, all the blended fertilizers that you buy should have every ingredient listed so the certifier can tell. We got this list here. This is what you typically see in blended fertility. <coughs> so we can we have access to every nutrient you might need. And you should, when you're doing soil testing, you should go beyond NPK. We want to know about the trace minerals. We want to know the relationship that each trace mineral has to each other. We want to know the cation exchange capacity and the organic matter. These all tell you things about the biological life in your soil and the availability of the nutrients to your crops. So go beyond NPK. Please, I beg. Manure. So if it's for human consumption, and if you're thinking about wheat or tofu beans, those are human consumed foods. You have to be paying attention to this manure regulation. If it's not, if it's going to be sold for livestock feed, this doesn't matter. You could put manure on your feed corn a day before you harvest it, we don't care. But if it's for human consumption, then you have to make sure that it's at least 120 days, I'm sorry, I'm the one thing, 120 days um, from the application to the harvest if the edible portion's in contact with soil particles. So that would be like potatoes or beets, and if it's not in contact with soil particles, which would be like corn or tofu beans or shell peas, but if you're growing edamame, you know what that is, where you eat the soybean, you're at 120 days. And that's why it's important for you to keep track of when and where you applied the manure, unless it's been composted. And if it's composted, then there's a, I didn't put it in here, but there's a strict a definition of what compost is. It has to have been turned five times in 15 days and been kept at a certain temperature, killing pathogens. But compost is also a wonderful thing because it doesn't have weed seeds. So just remember, anytime you bring in manure from off-farm, you're saying, welcome to new weed seeds from the neighbor. <laughs> so you're bringing in weed seeds because they have not been killed. So, what do you, somebody asked us this question earlier, what do you have to track with manure? No arsenic, they kind of stopped feeding arsenic to chickens, but I don't know how long they'll keep up that, so just, and of course if it's older manure, you're going to want to know, because arsenic is an element, and it will pass through and stay in the same form, it won't go away, it doesn't break down, because it's an element, and it does build up in the, in the soil, and it is actually on the national list as a prohibited natural. Um, nothing added to the manure pits to control odor or anything, but if they want to add lactobacillus, which kind of helps break down, that's natural, that's okay. So there are things that we can use. No fly spray. Somebody's got a pile of solid manure, you know, they go out there and it's all full of flies, they decide they're going to spray fly, fly spray on it or herbicide on it. Now you can no longer use that manure. So we don't care when it went into the animal. They could be fed GMO feed, they could have been given antibiotics, they could have had hormones, we don't care. But once it's out of the animal, nothing prohibited can go on. Wait, uh, yeah. Even GMO corn and soybean stocks are logged. My understanding is that uh, 
both the uh, pesticide and the, um, the altered genes are in every cell of the GMO crop. So and this is an area that, that make any sense. this is an area we're going to look at. I don't agree with that. I'm just telling you the rules. <coughs> I'm hoping that we'll be able to change that. And we'll see. So right now, if somebody's been, you know, they've been betting on GMO corn stocks or soybean, you know, GMO soybean stocks, they can still, you can still use that manure, according to the NOP. I said I didn't agree with everything. So really important, and this is this is part of the. There's a, a okay, um, there's a hierarchy for pest weed disease control, and so. This is where I said, remember, we're not input substitution. You must do cultural, mechanical, <coughs> biological activities first. And then you can use approved synthetics, provided that you show that the first two didn't work. So it's not input substitution. You have to go through the systems approach first. And it's only beneficial to do it that way. And so uh, here's something I love this. This is one of my favorite things. In, in the agricultural landscape, when you have big fields, right, versus smaller fields with lots of edges, Iowa State has done uh, 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 studies on this that depending on the, um, the increase in landscape diversity, the numbers of soybean aphids drop. <coughs> So ecological benefits from diversity, smaller fields. Is that from the Marsden Farm study or is that from something else? That's from the um, Iowa State University. Uh, Matt O'Neill is the professor. So this is you guys. You all have giant brains, especially compared to a soybean aphid. There may be a lot more of them than, you, than us, but let's substitute inputs with knowledge and management. So organic seeds, you don't need to use them during the transition years, but you still must use untreated non-GMO. And once you're certified, high price is not an acceptable reason to not buy organic seed. But to buy organic seed, just a sec, uh, you gain from what they're doing. The organic seed people are breeding in characteristics that you need, right? You want that corn to come out of the ground fast, right? Because you've allowed that soil to warm up and you want, boom, out of, out of the ground fast, you want it to canopy early. You know, you have certain things that you need. Now, they don't care about that in Pioneer. If anything, they probably want it to sit for a while because these guys are out today planting the corn, right? They're out there <laughs> early, 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 right? Because they got so many acres to cover and they just it's coated in fungicides, so they don't <coughs> care. But for us, we don't have those fungicides. So we have to plant into warm ground. And so we want, boom, we want things to grow. Where's the Blue River guy, right? Right? That's what your building is. So all the traits that they're not doing in conventional, the organic seed is, so it's worth it for you to pay more for organic seed. Yeah. Uh, I got a question when it comes to cover crops. I'd like to put some spinach uh, in a winter grazing mix. And they sell organic spinach for human consumption, but I'm not looking for a human product. I'm looking for bulk spinach seed. Which is really I don't, expensive. It's kind of hard to find, but I would you know there are some large, again, you have to make sure it's not treated. It doesn't have to be organic, but once it's organic, once that field is organic, it would have to be organic spinach seed. I would just do some searching. You know, um, there's a, a website called organicseedsearch.org, and there's a lot of uh, really good um, suppliers there. But your, your cover crop seed always has to be organic too. So the cover crop organic. seed has to be certified organic once you're certified. You don't have to use it when you're in transition, but yes, cover crop seed. Even must if you're not harvesting it. Even if you're not harvesting it, it must be certified organic. All seed. You can grow it yourself. Then it'll be certified seed. Um, so GMO inoculants, be careful of that. They're out there. Um, harvesting and storage. So you, you may have to make sure your equipment is clean, and we were talking about cleaning a combine. What should be done is purging. You basically go into the organic field, and you run a certain amount of bushels through the combine and document what that was. Give it to the neighbor, sell it down at the co-op, 
just somehow a documentation. That's the only way to really clean a combine. You can get in there, open all the doors, run it empty, you know, use your shop vac, use your compressed air, <coughs> and still do a purge. And John Deere did a test on that, and they had all these combines, and they tore it, they, they tried all these different ways of cleaning, and they tore it down to the bolts. I mean, they had like a whole airplane hanger where they took apart the combine. The only way they found it to be clean was after a purge. So, but it, if it's never been in conventional, it wouldn't. Then you don't need to. If it's clean, if it's dedicated organic, okay. you are good to go. And there are, especially if there's uh, organic growers all in one area, a lot of times you can get a document from the comp custom combine that the last place he was was at an organic farm, and then you wouldn't have to purge. And you can use uh, inoculants either in large square bales or silo bags as long as they are natural. Lactobacillus. Um, clean the bins. You got an air bin? Take out the floor. Clean everything out, right? Because if it's got GMO dust in the bottom, you turn on the fan. What are you going to do? You're going to spread all that GMO dust up into your, um, into your, your grain. <laughs> you don't want to do that. And of course, the buffer zones are considered non-organic and must be kept separate. And I, all this information is there. So real quick. The NRCS has um, programs and cost share to help you with that transition. So if you are, um, let me go past that. They have a conservation activity plan for transition to work. So there are technical service providers will come to your farm. The NRCS will give you a check to pay them to do this plan. And they will look at your farm and give you a uh, Options for conservation <coughs> programs that will help you in your transition to organic. You also have to be approved before you start the plan from NRCS. The yeah, yeah, you go and you get a contract. It's just like any other cost share. You get a contract. And then they also do this, uh, this woman does pollinator plans too. Is and I'm a, I'm a TSP to do those. Is that based plans. upon income? What's that? Is that. <coughs> So you go to the NRCS and you say, I would like a conservation activity plan for transition to organic. And they'll sign a contract with you. And then they'll help you find someone who is approved to write it. Are there very many of you? No. <laughs> There's only two or three that I know in, I Illinois. in Illinois. But well, we're working on that. So I want to keep going because I know that I'm, they're going to get the hook on me here. So... Um, so there's so there's help if you need a buffer zone, soil fertility, crop rotation, pest, weed, disease management. There's all kinds of practices. So for the buffer zone, you can actually get dollars from NRCS to put in pollinator habitat. It's called field border. You can put in hedgerows. You know, look at this. Is that going to you know be an excellent buffer to prevent drift, especially if you're having a lot of problems? The NRCS will help you. They'll pay an uh, uh, incentive to put that in. So here's the list. Again, you have all of this in your packet. So it lists all the numbers. You can talk in NRCS language, the NRCS guy, because he talks in numbers. And then, of course, too, if you have livestock, you cannot graze in the buffer zone either. So, and they have funding for interior fence. Okay, so this is like what it might look like. You might put in a windbreak, you might put in a hedgerow, field border, filter strips. Soil fertility. If you are currently just doing a corn bean rotation, they will give you incentive money to move to a rotation that includes a sod crop and a small grain. You can get a three to five year contract where you get payments from the NRCS for, for changing from continuous row crop. They'll pay you to do cover crops. They'll help you with residue management. They'll help you with interceding for mulching. All of those things um, for increasing organic matter. And uh, so this 1328 is one of the important ones. And that's what it might look like on your farm. Contour farming. I know a lot of you are not in real hilly areas, but even <coughs> strip cropping on a flat area, right? There are more field borders going. They will grass waterways, very important, even if you have mostly flat ground. The water moves somewhere. 
So you want to prevent, you know, you're going to be working really hard to build your organic matter. You don't want your soil washing away. So guess what? They have incentive for that. Critical area plantings. They have um, money to help you improve your, air, your farm. So same farm. Look at this. You can just load up with NRCS practices. Pest, weed, and disease management. And actually, that's one of the, the uh, secrets. The more you sign up for it, the more likely you're going to get funding. So you could do pest management, you know, putting in, like I said, the <coughs> insect habitat, conservation cover. Uh, if you have livestock, you know, there's lots of um, help with rotational grazing. They'll do nutrient management plans, irrigation water, transition to organic plants, pollinator plants, all kinds of great stuff. And I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, I did it in an hour. I killed it. <laughs> Let's take it.